In uh, the text, technical examinations of uh, stone sculptures to see if they are ancient or not, uh, especially in places such as Egypt in which there is a very dry climate, desert, sand. Uh, there are often in buried objects two processes that go hand in hand. One of them is uh, a continuous deposition of material uh, which give rise to a, what is called patina. And uh, that is usually an accretion of either siliceous or metallic components that come by direct deposition of sand and its components or uh, metals or metallic salts dissolved in groundwater and carried onto the surface of the objects where the water may evaporate and form what becomes later insoluble deposits. And there, usually, the manganese and iron salts predominate, and they form little accretions in addition to the uh, glaze or patina that uh, forms. They form accretions in form of uh, dark or even almost black crystals or crystallite uh, compounds. And these are insoluble manganese and iron compounds. And they are called dendrites because they look like little trees or uh, tree-like uh, compounds. And uh, these dendrites are extraordinarily hard and insoluble and cling tenaciously to a stone surface. Now this uh, is of interest because it has not been possible uh, to imitate these kind of dendrites. You can make dendrites of all kinds, but they are never uh, hard, insoluble, and, and uh, adhesive to the stone. So dendrites do form a, uh, a very interesting uh, basis for judging antiquity. The patina that I mentioned before is a kind of a um, glazed surface that is transparent, or at least translucent, and is very thin, but also extraordinarily tenacious. And you've probably seen or heard patina on other objects, on ivory, on copper, and so forth. And the name patina means different things on those, uh, on those other things. But on the stone, especially the desert, varnish, as, it's, as this particular pattern is called, is also indicative. And of course, you cannot really see it in the, with the naked eye. It takes a microscope or at least a good hand lens or so to even become aware of it. But it does give you kind of a general impression. And the interesting thing is that it cannot be washed off. You know, uh, The Egyptians like to produce an artificial pattern by burying uh, objects that they want to fake or that they have faked and they want to make look as if they were antique. They bury them in the sand or in dung or whatever and uh, produce an artificial pattern, but that washes off fairly readily. And really ancient objects, they are impermeable to such uh, washing. So that's the process of deposition. The, uh, pr at the same time, concomitant with this, uh, there's a process of erosion, which is comes about by uh, um, by the if the if the object is buried in sand uh, by the rubbing of sand grains a slight shift or if it's outdoors and and sand is uh, uh, blown over it by the wind there is a kind of an erosion pattern so this is um, kind of works against the formation of the pattern or at least it it interferes with it, but you can see the distinct influences quite well in really ancient objects. And again, it is very difficult to produce this sandblasting action artificially. I say difficult, I don't know if it's even possible. Uh, certainly in the days that we are in the days that we are talking about in the 20s when the particular object of interest were produced, there wasn't any such fine sandblasting technique. Just to tell you what I mean by this as compared to modern abrasive uh, processes. Um, the limestone of which the 
sculptures of very much your collection are uh, made uh, are a so-called nummulitic uh, or foraminiferal uh, limestone. That means that it, it is formed from sea deposits which contain a lot of very small shells or shell detritus. And uh, uh, they actually contain these minute shells that are as large as a millimeter, but also very much smaller. So they can see, be seen only with a microscope, I mean, except for the very large ones. Uh, now, these are also a calcareous uh, compound, a calcium carbonate largely. Uh, and they, their hardness differs only very little from the matrix in which they are deposited, the also calcium carbonate. And uh, then if, these, uh, if the processes of the wind blowing or the fine rubbing of the sand uh, goes on, it is the slightly softer uh, calcium carbonate matrix that is abraded more than the uh, little shells, and they stick out just a little bit above the matrix, quite generally speaking. Now, if you were to use a uh, regular abrasive, like uh, emery paper, so even the finest garnet paper so far, it would flatten it out quite evenly, and uh, it would not show this exaltation of the, of the uh, little shells. So this is a kind of an interesting thing that you can observe just almost with a hand lens, but certainly with a low-power micro microscope on many of the objects that we have been speaking about. The Mansour collection has objects like that. Yeah, exactly, yes. You can okay. see it almost everywhere. And every object that you look at, they will show this, uh, uh, this phenomenon. So uh, then there is another process of the original artificial erosion, if you will, uh, the polishing of the finished object, of the uh, almost finished object, it was polished not as we do today with uh, emery paper or whatever, uh, but rather with uh, rags or um, other holders of sand, of quartz sand, which is very hard, and uh, which, when rubbed over the surface, will produce irregular grooves. I mean, nearly parallel, but not quite parallel grooves. And this is very typical of the polishing marks that you see there. Also, they use si simple and single pointers rather than uh, uh, these uh, other more general um, procedures. And you can see that also. So both the artificial and the uh, natural erosion patterns are quite visible on there, and you can distinguish very nicely how the deposition processes and those of erosion have uh, competed after fashion.